Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson, and today I'm going to be looking at Brazil Imperial. Now the first thing that caught my eye about this game is this gorgeous cover. And you know what? The entire box is just gorgeous to look at. And the theme of this game, of building a, a prosperous empire, sounds like many other Euro games, but this one uses a modular map to recreate real regions of the world. And there are 10 different monarchs of various nationalities in here. And although I have very little knowledge about Brazilian history, the fact that they were making a Euro game incorporating real history definitely piqued my interest. Now the gameplay is pretty standard for a Euro game. You can be taking action on your player board in front of you to perform various functions. You know, building buildings, deploying troops, acquiring paintings, and trading resources and the like. But with that historical note, that really appealed to me. The game also has something that I really enjoy, that the players control the end of the game. You're going to be completing missions during the game, but only when a player finishes an Era 3 mission does your game actually end. So will this game go down in the annals of history, or should this be forgotten? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and I'll come back with my final thoughts on Brazil Imperial. So here's Brazil set up for three players. You will lay out the tiles based on the scenario you choose from the back of the book, and place the capital tiles face down on their spots. Place the exploration tiles face down in their spots as well. Place the combat and gold cards on their spot, and for each painting type, reveal two cards. Each player receives a player board along with all their components, and places them on the matching spaces on the board. The military, palaces, and you're going to have one of each type of products. Each player will also receive a leader, and they will choose which side to play as each side will offer different benefits. Each player also receives their three action tokens, one for each era, and two mission cards from each era. They will pick one for each era and return the others. Next, reveal all the capital tiles, and the first player will pick which one they want. If they choose the first player token, they will be the first player for the rest of the game, and all other players will receive whatever starting resources was on their chosen tile. Replace a tile with your spare palace. This is your starting capital city. Now the goal of the game, of course, is to get the most victory points by the end of the game. You'll be getting points by building buildings, getting your military out onto the board, making products, buying paintings, finishing your mission cards, some gold cards have end of game scoring on them, and getting your palaces out onto the board. And the game is played over three eras, and the eras will only change when one player has finished and revealed one of the current era mission cards. Since much of the action takes place on your player boards, let's have a quick look at it. Along the top of the board we'll show you which buildings are available to build in each era, what resources they cost to build, the terrain type they must be built on, and what they produce, and how many points they're worth at the end of the game. Since each tile is double-sided and can be flipped during the game, your board also shows you what's on the other side. Next, you have your military units, with what they cost to deploy underneath them and the points in their spaces. To the right are the materials you can produce during the game. Their resource cost is under them, and the points are shown on their space. Along the right-hand side of the board are your palaces, which are usually placed out when you complete one of your mission cards. It will show you the requirements above them, and in their spot will show you what benefit they give. Across the bottom of the board are the actions you can take, and you'll be taking one of these actions per round, and each round you must be taking a different action. Now let's go back to the game board. A player's turn will consist of doing an action, that is placing your action token on one of the action spaces on your player board, and then doing a movement with your military on the board, and perhaps a bonus movement as well. Let's go through the different actions you can take. The deploy action allows you to move one of your military units off of the board onto one of your cities or capitals and pay the cost listed underneath a unit. Then draw a military card. You can skip deploying a unit and just draw a military card for this action. Once deployed, a military unit never goes back onto your player board. If you lose it in combat, it goes back to beside your board and can be deployed again later at, with no cost. The combat cards will usually have a combat action on their back and are played usually during a combat action. The painting action allows you to buy one of the face-up paintings at the cost printed on the painting. These might give you a one-time action when you first buy it, or it could be an ongoing ability. The build action is the most complex action. You're going to select a building from the piles available to you and choose which side to build. It must be placed next to an existing tile that you own, but not next to any enemy tiles, and must be on the appropriate terrain type. Pay the cost to build it, and add the resources as shown on the tile by the white gear. To build a city, you choose one of the two cities that are face up, and the cities can only be placed where your monarch military unit is currently on the board. Building a city does not need to be adjacent to one of your current buildings, but it cannot be next to an enemy building. Since buildings are the main way you produce, let's quickly talk about production. You can use resources and assets produced by your buildings to make payments or trades, but these buildings will not produce goods again until you take the renovate action. 
There are six different resources and assets in the game. There are four basic ones, sugarcane, coffee bean, brazil wood, and cotton. Then there's gold, which can be used as any basic resource during the game. And finally, science, which can be used as any other resource or gold. So, to renovate the building, it cannot have any resources on it. You must pay one resource, and you cannot use a resource from a building to make it empty, then renovate it on the same action. You can then either replenish the current resources from the face-up side, or flip the tile over and generate those resources. I'm going to skip manufacturing for a second and go to the harbor action. Here you can trade resources or cards for other items. Give up what's on the left to get what's on the right, and you can do as many of these trades as you want for the action. You can take the resources or assets from anywhere, your buildings or your personal supply, but any assets you get back have to go into your personal supply. Your personal supply can only hold five resources. And you can only have three gold cards. Gold cards can be used as either gold when buying something, or have the ability or an end game scoring on the other side. If they're used for gold or their action, they're going to be discarded. Let's go back to manufacturing. This allows you to produce a product. You want to pay the cost listed under the product and move its token to a matching symbol on the action space. There are two spots for each product. Placing this product on an action will enhance that action next time you take it. If you upgrade your deploy action, you can deploy an extra unit and draw an extra card. The upgraded painting action reduces the cost of paintings. Upgrading the build action allows you to use any resources any other while building. Upgrading your renovate means you do not have to pay a resource to renovate. Upgraded manufacturing reduces the cost to produce something. And the upgraded harbor action allows you to draw an extra gold card when you do a transaction. Once you've taken your action, you get one free movement of any one of your military units on the board. Additionally, you get a bonus movement based on the action you took, which is listed across the bottom of your player board. These bonus movements can be done before or after your free movement. So movement will be vital to get your monarch around the board so you can build cities. You can move any unit onto an exploration tile and flip it over, or you can move your military units into another player's units or buildings to initiate combat. So let's quickly talk about combat. Combat is resolved by comparing the combat strength of the attacker to the defender in the space that the combat is happening. The combat strength of a unit, building, or city is equal to its victory points. Your military units have different abilities, which I'm not going to go into here. Some can bring other units with them, some can have a free movement to attack adjacent spaces, etc. But once combat is started, the attacker can use any of their paintings and harbor action if applicable. They can then play up to three face-down combat cards. The defender then does the same. Cards are then revealed, and the attacker applies all of their card and painting effects first. Winning or losing, all cards are discarded. The player with the highest total combat strength wins the combat, and defenders win ties. The losing player must move all of their defeated units to their personal supply, not back to their boards, but just to back to their supply. If the attacking player won on a building or city, they seize control of it. It will remain under their control as long as they have at least one military unit on it. If all enemy military units are removed from a seized building or city, its control immediately goes back to the original player who owned it. So those are all the actions you can take on your turn. So let's talk about the end of eras and the end of the game. An era does not have a set number of rounds. The end of an era occurs when one player finishes their first mission card of that era. When a player finishes their first era in one mission, all players move into era two. Players do not have to reveal their completed mission cards, but it's the only way to advance the game into the next era, and only revealed era one and two cards will score at the end of the game. When an era ends, the player who completed the mission will take one of their palaces from the side of their board and place it in the corresponding spot. Each palace has a different requirement of where it can be placed, and each one is going to give you a different ability. All players then take their current era tokens, flip it over, and place it under one of their actions. This will give that action a bonus every time you take that action. All players then take their next era token. Now other players of course can complete previous era missions and will still be able to place out their palaces when they do complete a mission. When a player reveals an era 3 mission, the current round is finished and we go to end of game scoring. You'll gain points from the military units deployed, products manufactured, paintings acquired, era 1 and era 2 missions that are revealed, and any era 3 missions you have left in your hand. There could be some end of game scoring on your gold cards, any exploration tiles you have acquired that are worth points, palaces on the map, and finally buildings or city tiles in your possession, including seize tiles, will add to your point total. And the player with the most points is the winner. Let's get back to see what I thought about Brazil Imperial. So, theme and components. First off, the theme. This is how you do theme in a Euro game. They've tried to get as much theme as possible into this game, and it comes off so well. There's an entire history book here, which covers the all the monarchs in the game, and kind of the backstory of Brazil. And the monarch's special abilities themselves are tied, albeit loosely, to their history. 
almost all the scenarios on the back of the book kind of have a little description of the area on Earth that they represent. Now, to be fair, this is still a Euro game at heart, and the actions you're doing aren't overly thematic, but they make sense for the most part to the theme this game is going for. But I'm still not exactly sure how a painting can help you in battle. Anyway, onto the components. Again, really nice example of how good a Euro game can look. All the art in this game is absolutely beautiful, from the rule book to the paintings to the monarch. Just everything looks so nice. Even the tiles themselves look really nice. The wooden components, again, very nice. A few minor negatives though, the rule book probably could have used another pass as there are definitely some rules that were not as clear as I had wanted. And the storage in the box is not great. There's a plastic insert for all the resources that you just kind of have to take out and dump onto the table due to how small the, the compartments are. Those are just little niggles, but seeing how much time they spent on the look of this game, it's just something that stands out as, eh, not as not as nice. Onto the gameplay. When I first opened up this rule book and saw 22 pages, I thought this was going to be a long and complicated game. Not a problem, just that's what I was expecting. It turned out to be much quicker and easier to get into than I thought. The gameplay is your basic get resources to build buildings to expand your empire. You're doing this to complete your mission cards, and those cards will dictate kind of what you're going to be doing this, to this game. Each step you're taking is not overly complicated. You want to buy a painting? Pay the resource, take the painting. You need more resources? Build or renovate a building. It's kind of that simple. But that's not to thing, say things are fairly straightforward. Your monarch special ability really helps you to kind of direct you on how to achieve your missions. And the manufacturing can really help you, but for example, you might get sidetracked into doing a lot of manufacturing early, but have you left your enough, uh, yourself enough time to catch up with the missions, as this game almost feels like a race with those missions. I really enjoy the variability of this game. You pick from the back of the book which scenarios you want to play, and it lets you kind of dictate how much combat you want to happen, so you can tailor it to your group. The different monarchs all have different abilities, which results in different gameplay approaches. Each time you play with a different monarch, you approach the game slightly differently. I also like that the combat was completely up to the players. Some map layouts have a high chance of having combat because the players are closer together, but it's not guaranteed. If your group is not big on direct attacking, there's no big hindrance not to attack. You can still win the game by never attacking another player on the board. So you can see that there's a lot of things I really like about this game, but it's not all perfect and I do have some issues with the game. I don't think the monarch abilities are balanced. Napoleon feels like he's a little overpowered with his ability to use military cards as resources. I found all my games involving Napoleon turn into nothing but a race against another player. They don't have to worry about board state. They'll quickly be manufacturing a product and upgrading their deploy action so every time, well every other turn, they're going to be getting two resource cards or military cards they can use as resources. I was also not a big fan of some of the goal cards. Some of them are pretty useful, but there are a few to be even more powerful than that. And it's just kind of random if you get them. Being able to take a mission card from playing a gold card can be huge. And speaking of mission cards, I wish it was more of a draft than just kind of being dealt two per air and you pick one. Sometimes you get cards that all fall in line with your requirements, and sometimes not. I think a draft might have helped with that. And for all my talk of variability, the game does start to feel a little same if you always play with the same monarch. Even if you switch up the monarchs, after play or two with a monarch, you kind of know what approach works best for them. Beyond what the monarch is bringing, your overall approach to the game really doesn't change much. Getting your troops onto the map, building cities, and finish off missions will get you the most points. And that's what most players are going to end up doing. The other things can't be forgotten, but most players focus on the same thing. And I found that each game, you kind of ended up focusing on the same things. But would I recommend this game? My most definitely would. Even though I had a few gripes, overall it's a very enjoyable game. I loved the theme and components in this one. On that front, this game should be held up as examples to other Euro games to show them how to have an interesting theme and gorgeous components. I really like the gameplay. It's a good level of complexity as it requires you to plan, but you have to have a good solid direction based on your mission cards and your monarch. I like that the players control the speed of the game. The players decide when they're going to go into the next stage. I like that the game forced you to make some really good decisions. You know, manufacturing definitely helps in the long run. But is it worth the resources early on to do that? Or what palaces to place out? Or even when or if you're going to be doing combat? And although the game has a lot to go for it, there were some negatives for me. The game ends up feeling like a race. I felt like you didn't get a chance to explore, and the theme just goes out the window because of that race feeling. I wasn't sure the game is completely balanced. Some of the monarchs definitely feel more powerful than others, and some of the same thing with the gold cards. The monarchs can also dictate your entire gameplay. The gold cards, like I said, can be very swingy, and I do wish the mission cards were drafted, and I do think that the next time I'm playing, I'm going to try that. 
And finally, I felt the game got samey after a while as my approach with the monarchs I played seemed to be the same each time I played with them. Even though I'm counting this as negative, there are 10 different monarchs in this game. So for you, that might not be much of an issue. Overall, though, I'm going to give this game an 8 out of 10 in the Dice Tower Seal of Approval. This game has a lot going for it, and you can definitely feel the passion that went into this game. I ended up really liking this game, and I would definitely sit down and play it again. I'm not sure I love the game, which is why it just misses that seal of excellence for those few minor things I said. But this is a good solid euro that is staying in my collection. And that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching.